Okay, today we will be doing the current affairs for uh, the 7th of March. Okay. Uh, now, uh, today we will be discussing some of the very static uh, topics uh, such as Ramsar wetlands and then, uh, okay, uh, this is rega regarding a training aircraft which has been indigenously developed in India itself by the CSIR. Further, uh, we will be reading amongst the most important things would be artificial intelligence in the judicial process, how it is important and uh, how India can move ahead and catch up with the West, which is already using artificial intelligence and machine learning in judicial processes. And uh, most of the other topics, okay, the other important topic is predatory pricing. Uh, while the other topics are pretty static in nature. Now moving on. Okay. Uh, this is a map of all the Ramsar sites of India. Please remember all the sites and try to remember what are the largest, which is the largest Ramsar site, uh, which is the smallest one. The Renuka, Renuka uh, Lake in Himachal would be the smallest one. And I believe uh, Sundarbans would be the largest one. Also, read about, uh, you know, if there are any specialities about each of these Ramsar wetlands, read about that. Because uh, Ramsar wetlands are asked in some form or the other. They'll either be directly asked as to which state they belong to. Or uh, there might be some of these Ramsar sites which are also biosphere reserves or some of them which might be wildlife sanctuaries. And there might be a question related to that. So please read uh, all of them, like say for example, look the click. So read all of that. Uh, this includes all the Ramsar sites till now, which have been named in the list. Okay, why, sir, why are uh, these wetlands in the news? Because an encouraging trend of water birds and species diversity has been observed from the wetlands of Punjab. Now what are the wetlands inside Punjab, which are a part of the Ramsar? Please locate it. This is Punjab. So some of them are Bias Conservation Reserve, Kanchli Wetland, Harike Wetland, uh, Roper, and then Nangal. So all these are uh, the different wetlands which are there in uh, Punjab. There must be one more. Uh, uh, I'm guessing it's Keshopur Miyani Community Reserve. This is another one. So there are six wetlands in Punjab. Okay. Now you can read all of them over here, uh, which are the different different uh, uh, Ramsar sites, which are important. Okay, now some of the birds that keep visiting these wetlands in Punjab are uh, given over here. Try to read the IUCN status of as many birds as possible. This northern lapwing, it's of least concern in the IUCN status. So similarly, read the IUCN status of some of these birds, uh, especially focus on all those birds which are critically endangered and endangered in the IUCN. And uh, uh, remember them because uh, UPSC asks about these uh, birds and animals very frequently. Also read the peculiar characteristics of these endangered and critically endangered animals. Okay, and which uh, wildlife sanctuary they are found in, in India. Now, what are wetlands? According to Ramsar Convention, wetlands are areas of marsh, fen, peatland or water, whether natural or artificial, permanent or temporary, with water that is static or flowing, fresh water, brackish water or salty water, any sorts of water bodies, including areas of marine water, where the depth uh, which at low tide does not exceed 6 meters. So, including marine water in which the depth of the water at low tide should not increase, uh, should not exceed 6 meters. All these would be called as wetlands. Okay, moving on. Now, Ramsar Convention. Now, the Ramsar Convention is an international treaty for the conservation and sustainable use of wetlands. It is also known as the Convention on Wetlands. It's named after Ramsar in Iran. 
At the center of the Ramsar philosophy is the wise use of wetlands. It doesn't completely ban the use of wetlands, rather it promotes the wise use of wetlands in a sustainable manner. Wise use is nothing but maintenance of ecological characters within the context of sustainable development. So, wise use concept is related to Ramsar sites. At the time of joining the convention, each contracting party undertakes to designate at least one wetland site for inclusion in the list of wetlands of international importance. Okay. Each country, each contracting party has at least one wetland site. Now, there are over 2300 Ramsar sites in the entire world and the country with the highest number of Ramsar sites is United Kingdom. Okay. In India, there are around 50 Ramsar sites. 50 sites are there. Now, within the, Mon within the Ramsar sites, we have uh, this thing called the Montrix record. Now, this Montrix record is nothing but a register of those wetlands where changes in the ecology have occurred, are occurring or are likely to occur as a result of technological developments and pollution and other human interaction with those wetlands. It is maintained as a part of the Ramsar list. So, Please do check if at all uh, Indian sites, any of the Indian sites are within even the Montrex record. Also check if Chilika is a part of the Montrex record. And if Chilika is a part, what are the other lakes which are a part of the Montrex record? Okay. Okay. Next uh, news. Locally made trainer aircraft finishes sea trials. Now, what is the locally made uh, uh, fight uh, trainer aircraft? It is known as Hansa NG. The first indigenous aircraft trainer, Hansa NG, developed by the CSIR, National Aerospace Laboratories, has completed the sea level trials in Puducherry, which is needed before the DGCA can approve it as a trainer aircraft. Now, Hansa NG, NG stands for New Generation, is one of the most advanced flying trainers powered by a Rotax digital control engine. Okay, it has a digital control engine and it has several speciality features such as a composite lightweight airframe, a glass cockpit, a bubble canopy with a wide panoramic view, electrically operated flaps. Okay. The CSIR NAL, the National uh, Aerospace Laboratories, says that the aircraft is designed to meet the needs of flying clubs in India because it is of very low cost and it has very low fuel consumption. Hence, it is very suitable for Indian uh, aircrafts. Okay. Also, it should be remembered that this is a two-seater aircraft and it is nothing but a revamped version of the original Hansa, which was developed around 30 years ago. So, this is the first indigenous aircraft trainer in India, Hansa NG. And it is low cost and it is a low fuel consumption vehicle. Democracy Report 2022. The latest edition of the Democracy Report was released recently by the Wiedem Institute at Sweden's University of Gothenburg. Now, the title of that report is Democracy Report 2022, Autocratization, Changing Nature. Please remember the title, it can be asked in the prelims directly. Now, this particular report, Democracy Report, classifies countries into four regimes. Uh, one is liberal democracies, two is electoral democracies, three is electoral autocracies, and four is closed autocracies. Observations made in the report, more than twice as many countries are undergoing autocratization as compared to democratization. So countries which are undergoing autocratization are more than two times of those countries which are undergoing democratization. It's a big problem. The level of democracy enjoyed by the average global citizen in 2021 is down to 1989 levels, which is even before the split of USSR. Hence, the current level of democracy that we have is nothing but it is equivalent to the democracy which was enjoyed by people in 1989. And uh, the democratic gains in the post-Cold War in a scenario have eroded completely. When it comes to India, okay, when it comes to India, this particular index, it classifies India as a electoral autocracy. 
we spoke about the four different types of uh, uh, countries uh, in four different types of regimes that countries have been uh, classified into over oh, here india falls into electoral autocracy why it is one of the top 10 autocratizers in the world according to the report india is a part of the broader global trend of anti plural political party driving a country's autocratization i mean i think the sentences are very self explanatory it just means that pluralism means multiple people more diversity more number of people being a part of electoral system uh, when we have anti plural political parties driving auto it, the report says that india has anti plural political parties driving india's autocratization india is ranked around 93rd in the index india figures in the bottom 50% of the countries it has slipped down further in the electoral democracy index to 100 and even lower in the deliberative component index to 102 this entire ldi or the liberal democratic index it comprises of two parts like what we spoke of over here one is the electoral component which means elections and voting and the other one is deliberative component which talks about discussions and uh, role of parliament etc so in the electoral uh, democracy index india's ranking is 100 while in the deliberative index india's rank is 102 and uh, on the whole india's rank is around 93 in south asia india is ranked be below sri lanka nepal bhutan and just above pakistan now, what is the autocratization that has been defined in this report? Uh, or what drives it? The reason for autocratization is polarization. Polarization means having one single opinion and moving to one extreme in the spectrum. See, there are leftist ideas, then there are centrist ideas, there are rightist ideas. So, ideally, for a healthy discussion, there needs to be different combination of ideas. Uh, polarization means completely shifting to only one particular end either being completely leftist or being only completely rightist extreme rightist so uh, the report suggests that one of the reasons for autocratization is polarization and it is a dominant trend in 40 countries as opposed to five countries that showed rising polarization in 2011 autocratization is defined as a phenomenon that erodes respect of counter arguments and associated aspects of the deliberative component of democracy. There is no discussion in autocratization. It is only stream rolling of one's opinion onto the others. Predatory pricing. The Competition Commission of India has dismissed allegations of predatory pricing against uh, this shopping platform called Shopee. Predatory pricing is nothing but you know keeping the prices in such a low manner you know in order to eliminate out all the competition once you eliminate out all the competition then there will be a monopoly you will be the only person and once there is a monopoly you can charge any amount of prices that you want charge high prices that's the biggest problem so uh, predatory pricing is nothing but the illegal act of setting prices low to eliminate competition uh, predatory pricing violates antitrust laws as it makes markets more vulnerable to a monopoly okay so antitrust laws are always related to competition if at all there is a mcq question asking antitrust laws are dealt with by whom in india you have to write competition commission of india Co antitrust laws come in only in the case of competition remember it establishing that a business is engaging in predatory pricing requires that the enterprise which is being accused of predatory pricing is a dominant player in the relevant market its goods or services are being marketed below the actual cost of manufacture sub tactics are being used with the intention of eliminating other competition okay now what is the competition commission of india it is a 
it is a body which is there to regulate the way competition is happening and to remove predatory pricing from happening it has to encourage competition it was a statutory body established under the competition act of 2002 for administration implementation and enforcement of the act now the chairman and members there are one there is one chairman and there are six members who are appointed by the central government the chairperson and every other member shall be a person of ability and integrity who is qualified enough to be a judge of the high court or has professional experience of not less than 15 years in international trade economics business commerce law finance etc or any other person who the government thinks is fit now what are the functions of this competition commission of india it has to eliminate practices having adverse effects on competition it has to promote and sustain competition it has to protect the interests of consumers and ensure freedom of trade in the markets okay eliminate practices promote competition and protect the interests of consumers also please remember that earlier we had this thing called as the competition appellate tribunal to which appeals could be made from the competition commission of india but now all appeals from competition commission of india are heard by the nc lat national company law appellate tribunal artificial intelligence in judicial processes now during the 2022 budget session the law minister mr kiran rijiju had said that while implementing the phase 2 of the e codes project which has been under operation since 2015 a need was felt to adopt new cutting edge technologies such as machine learning and artificial to increase the efficiency of justice system in india please read the e codes uh, project uh, the e codes project is under the ministry of law and justice now what is artificial intelligence in judiciary please know what artificial intelligence is artificial intelligence is when there are uh, when there are objects uh, based on technology which are able to assess the situation and take the decisions that humans would take in that particular situation with all the information that they have now to explore the use of artificial intelligence in the judicial domain the supreme court has constituted the artificial intelligence committee which has identified the application of artificial intelligence technology in translation of judicial documents legal research assistance and process automation several law firms are now keen on trying out new technology for quick reference on judicial precedents and pronouncements on cases with similar legal issues at stake okay there is already a lot of research that's happening to use artificial intelligence to be able to find other uh, cases which have had a similar outcome and all uh, there is a mumbai based company known as riverus which has developed machine learning applications that go through many cases understand them and uh, you know uh, give out information about those cases which are similar uh, to the existing case at hand this is what you know any junior in a law firm has to do he has to go through several cases which are similar to the case at hand and he has to try and quote evidence from that case and uh, he can use it to better his argument okay now present status of technology or artificial intelligence in judiciary uh, because of covid 19 we saw that there was a heavier use of technology for e-filing and virtual hearings we could see that because courts could not function in the normal manner many of the court sessions were happening in a virtual manner uh, supreme court of india itself emerged as a leader in using technology by conducting more than 180000 virtual hearings but one of the problems of machine learning in india's legal sphere has been that it is completely restricted only to automating the back end work 
and is still a very long way from being used as a decision making tool for judiciary artificial intelligence has hardly been used to automatically calculate and provide judgments very less use has been done but rather artificial intelligence has been used in the back end work for computing the number of cases which are in backlog stage how many years it will take the indian judiciary is already using some amount of artificial intelligence uh, through these two applications uh, one is suvas and the other one is supase now uh, suvas is nothing but a language learning application which is used to translate uh, judgments say for example the as you know that the indian supreme court gives out verdicts in english now this suvas translates it into nine different languages like marathi tamil uh, hindi telugu etc okay uh, and supase it's nothing but it can provide a legal uh, brief it takes it takes the basics of the case as input and it produces a legal document by itself in a brief manner okay next advanced version of brahmos missiles the indian navy has successfully test fired a naval variant long range version of the brahmos cruise missile recently okay please read the differences between cruise missiles and ballistic missiles okay cruise missiles and ballistic missile now uh uh a ballistic missile follows a ballistic missile path okay it uh, travels along this huge arc sort of a thing doesn't travel directly while a cruise missile travels directly to that uh, target and it strikes it now uh, it has a more straight path and it has a lower altitude while in the case of ballistic missiles they often go out of the atmosphere also they have a very high path what is the brahmos missile brahmos missile was uh, jointly developed by india and russia that is the reason why it's called brahmos Bra- from the brahmaputra river of india and mos from the moscow river in russia now its speed it flies at three times the se- speed of sound at mac 2.8 which means that it is a supersonic missile missile it has a range of around 350 to 400 kilometers which means that it is a medium range weapon it is not a very long range or not a short range weapon but rather a medium range weapon uh like what we spoke of the nomenclature is from there okay please read the engine components in the first stage you have a solid rocket booster while in the second stage you have a liquid ramjet uh Uh, not today but some other day we'll discuss how ramjet and scramjet work okay these just work based on the oxygen or air which is flowing into them they use that particular air as an oxidizer one day we'll discuss this in detail future plans india became a part of the mtcr in 2016 because it managed to develop its own uh, missiles which are more than 300 kilometers in range hence now india and russia are now planning to develop a new generation of brahmos missiles which have more than 800 kilometers of range not just this 350 to 400 kilometers but rather more than 800 kilometers of range this was halted earlier because india was not a part of mtcr now please uh, read some of these features it can be used on multiple platforms air land sea okay it is a fire and forget type of missile you can fire and you can forget it it will go and hit the target 
it has a low radar signature okay and it has a quicker engagement with the target and there is pinpoint accuracy okay uh, moving on northern river terrapin this is one of those animals which has which is critically endangered in nature we earlier spoke of how it's important to read animals which are endangered and critically endangered hence batakur baska or the northern river terrapin is a very important animal that you have to know uh the populations of this batakur baska were decimated to such an extent the species could be considered ecologically extinct resulting from over exploitation and growth of industrial fishing okay now hence uh, these a lot of these turtles were taken and they were uh, they were extinct in the wild only in the wild they were extinct and hence under captivity they were bred in order to bring them back into normal populations earlier experts and forest officials had installed gps transmitters on this batakur baska in the indian sundarbans after installing those gps transmitters it was found that after 6 weeks after release at least 3 of those 10 individuals on whom the gps transmitters were placed had traveled hundreds of kilometers into bangladesh itself okay now what is this northern river terrapin it is a species of riverine turtle it is not a marine turtle it is a riverine turtle and it is one of the largest turtles to be found in entire southeast asia it's critically endangered uh, please read what are the what is the classification to be critically endangered uh there shouldn't be more than 50 units of that animal in the wild and it should have lost more than 90% of its population in the last uh, two decades i guess these are some of the criterion please read them in detail because we can't discuss every possible thing i can tell you what are the important things that have to be read from prelims perspective currently they are found in bangladesh and in india in the sundarbans cambodia indonesia and malaysia and they are extinct in myanmar singapore thailand and vietnam please remember all these things it becomes very important thank you